my grandfather and my grandmother may have spoke to, you know, their children about it or something or, you know, heard other people talk about it in the family. And I think that's how she got the information. I'd actually like to find the place that was, that he was hung and have a plaque there. And I, I'd like for it to be recognized. I think that he deserved it. Sitting along the border of Tennessee and Virginia, the town of Bristol was incorporated in 1856, just five years before the U.S. Civil War. By the mid-1890s, the two towns had grown to over 6,000 residents. The city boasted two railroad lines and acted as a regional hub for transportation and trade. Bristol's racially segregated downtown contained a vibrant black business district dubbed Black Bottom. In his 1954 book, The Negro in American Life and Thought, this period of time was classified by historian Rayford Logan as the nadir of American race relations. Logan tried to determine the year when the Negro's status in American society was at its lowest point. On Sunday, June 7, 1891, around 3 a.m., an intoxicated man entered the home of a respectable white lady, 31-year-old Mary Johnson Warren. Allegedly, he sexually assaulted her. Mary's husband, John Warren, worked at night for the Norfolk and Western Railroad, leaving her home alone every other week. It was reported that the assailant entered her home in their socks. They extinguished her lamp and threatened Mrs. Warren with death. According to newspaper reports, the police surveilled the 20-year-old Robert Clark for the next three days. He was placed under arrest at the home of his girlfriend, where he was found sleeping. Born around 1871, Robert Clark had various attributes assigned to him. A handyman, desperado, very bad character, Negro, a young mulatto, colored boy, and a rapist. He was a convict who had spent time in the Tennessee and Virginia penitentiaries. Though we've been unable to verify those claims of criminality, most of the story that follows is not in dispute. On Friday, June 12th, a preliminary trial was held, officiated by Bristol, Virginia Mayor William A. Rader. Trial attorneys included a Mr. Hamilton for the prosecution and Mr. Paul for the defense. Lewis Henderson, a black man living on the Tennessee side of Bristol, testified that at about 4 a.m., Robert Clark passed his home and was drunk. Several witnesses, black and white, also testified seeing the inebriated Clark out that night and of hearing him boast about what he had done. Acquaintances of the accused reportedly told police during their investigation damaging information. There were no witnesses in support of his defense, leaving the wholly circumstantial evidence against him to remain. Early the next day, on Saturday, June 13th, a crowd of all colors, ages, and races began to gather outside of the jailhouse. Before noon, people from the town of Bristol, as well as the surrounding countryside, were milling about with talk of lynching. Local lawyers and prominent men made loud and long pleas for the crowd to disperse and let the law take its course. In a contradictory report from the Johnson City Comet, Mr. Warren went to the courthouse at the close of the trial with a rope in hand and was restrained. While this was happening outside of the jailhouse, a Bristol news reporter was interviewing Robert Clark in his cell. From his report, the prisoner was completely calm about the situation and proclaimed his complete innocence and ignorance of the crime he was accused of. At some point, a rumor began circulating that the jailer was attempting to sneak Clark out of the back door of the jail. At 12.30 p.m., someone in the crowd proclaimed, if it had been the wife of one of the lawyers, they would say go. But as it was only the wife of a poor working man, it is all right. Reportedly, this reply set the spark for what was to come. Someone in the mob obtained an ax and urged the others to follow him. The front door to the jail facing Lee Street was broken down and members of the mob surged into the building. The crowd of almost 2,000 stormed the Bristol, Virginia jailhouse, broke down the doors and abducted Robert Clark from his cell. 
Someone appeared shouting, I have him, let him out. Three or four men brought Clark out into the street. Shouts, cheers, hurrahs, and hats in the air accompanied the mob's acquisition of the accused. Soon, the crowd grew to over 3,000. The party acted more like a victorious team than a group of men and boys who only a few hours before had been quiet, respectable citizens of the community. By the maskless mob, Clark was taken northwest, up Lee Street, passing porch-filled houses. Some residents yelled their condemnations at the mob, to no avail. Traveling up Mary Street, the scene of the original crime, one mile out of Bristol to the suburbs, to a place called Lindsay Grove, near the eastern edge of Sullins College. There, the mob stopped a wagon and commandeered a trace chain from the gearing of a horse. The chain was placed around the victim's neck. At some point in the ruckus, a single person demanded that Robert Clark be allowed to make a statement. In a calm voice, he declared, once again, his innocence. Clark stated that the first he had heard of the crime was when he was arrested. He admitted being drunk that night of Miss Warren's assault, so drunk that he went out on the town without his shoes on. As far as those who testified against him, he also denied having talked to them at all. At that statement, he was asked if he would be willing to face trial according to law in the courts. Robert Clark said that he would. He was then allowed to pray and his prayer included forgiveness for the lynch mob's mistake and his own indiscretions. He concluded his words by asking the mob not to mutilate his body or riddle it with bullets. That request, exhibiting his familiarity with the usual lynching process of cutting of body parts for souvenirs, burning or using the hanging corpse as target practice. He was then lifted up by several men while the chain was attached to a chestnut tree by a young man. The makeshift noose failed to hold as his body hung and fell several times. Eventually, the murderers succeeded in their efforts. A citizen of Georgia placed a note on the hanging body stating that no one should remove it until 5 p.m. At some point during the lynching, a black man in the crowd stated that if the people of his race had stuck together, Clark wouldn't have died. Immediately, several pistols were produced and were placed toward the speaker's face with the threat of lynching him as well. By 1.15 p.m., Robert Clark's body had stopped convulsing. The coroner's jury determined that the death was committed by persons unknown, leaving an intense feeling among the city's black population. Being that the abduction and murder of Mr. Clark occurred in the middle of the day, it was immediately clear who the ringleaders of the action were. Charles Davis, Nick Detter, Fleming Luttrell, Frank Nade, and Stephen Collins. After a week-long grand jury session, these men were indicted by the city of Bristol, Virginia on June 19, 1891, for having with force and arms in and upon the body of Robert Clark, feloniously, willfully, deliberately, premeditatedly, and of malice and aforethought, make an assault, and with certain trace chains in their hands did put and fasten around the neck of said Robert Clark, and then and there did hang him to a tree, of which said hanging by neck, he there instantly died. Thus did they murder against the peace and dignity of the Commonwealth of Virginia. Legal proceedings against the main perpetrators continued months after the fact. With the arrest of Charles Davis, the 18-year-old who had fastened the chain-made noose to the chestnut tree. Davis was released on a $500 bond signed by several prominent citizens. The four others indicted in the atrocity were never arrested. Though indictments were issued, it was publicly assumed no one would be held accountable for Robert Clark's murder. It was noted in the Shenandoah Herald that the same class of people protesting the lynching publicly also supported the actions of the lynch mob. 
the Bristol, Virginia Bar expressed some interest in passing resolutions addressing the lynching, but also voiced concerns that local papers would not publish it. In 1892, journalist Ida B. Wells reflected on the proliferation of lynchings throughout the United States at the time, expressing the opinion, That old threadbare lie that Negro men rape white women. If Southern men aren't careful, a conclusion might be reached, which will be very damaging to the moral reputation of their women. This idea of rape and even criminal behavior is not so much connected to lynching, but that lynching was a means to keep blacks down who were very economically competitive at this point. Some 130 years later, it's doubtful we will ever really know if Robert Clark raped Mary Johnson Warren, if he died for the crimes of another person, or if Mrs. Warren had simply been discovered in a consensual extramarital affair with a black man. We do know that Robert Clark was not given the right of a full and fair trial and that he was killed at the hands of a lynch mob on the afternoon in June 1891.